Turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Bear with me with the microphone and things today. I know it feels a little funny with using the microphone today, but that's a lot, trust me, it's a lot easier than if I was shouting the whole time because I'll be out of a voice by the end of it. That's why Jesus used the lakes. Like I was talking to you guys about last week, when you talk across a lake, it carries for miles. So, little drink of coffee. Okay, John chapter 16, verse 8. Um, I want to talk a little bit more today about the Holy Spirit. And we started this last week, and so we're going to carry this on a little bit into this week. And um, we're kind of setting up or setting the stage for Pentecost. So we had Easter. And um, remember, Jesus was crucified. He raised from the dead a few days later. And then a few weeks later, he sent the Holy Spirit and a bunch of people in an upper room, uh, in a room upstairs, uh, received the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to lead up to that. We'll get there at some point. Um, For now, what I want to talk about is John chapter 16, verse 8, uh, which is something I touched on last week. And it's the advantage that we have having received the Holy Spirit. It's the advantage that we have since Jesus chose to go to the Father. Um, When I read that last week, it kind of just, you know, you read through Scripture. And and even sometimes while I'm up here preaching, you're you're in the midst of Scripture and something just quickens in your mind. And and, and it kind of just pops out at you in Scripture. And for me last week, that was this word advantage. The fact that we have the advantage of having received the Holy Spirit. So a few questions came to mind as I I thought about that and read that. Um, We had the example of Peter, and we were discussing Peter's encounter with Jesus in the beginning. And let me just recap real fast for you. Peter first met Jesus after he got done fishing and caught nothing. Jesus came along and said, Peter, let's get back in the boat. I need to borrow it and go out on the water so that I can speak to all these people that are on the shore. So he goes out with Peter on the water. After he's done talking, says to Peter, throw your net back in the water. Peter does, after complaining, saying, Jesus, I already did that. It didn't work. Jesus says, go a little deeper, throw your net back in the water. He throws his net back in the water, and he catches more fish than he can handle. And he goes, I'm going to follow this guy from now on because he's good for, he's just smart, right? I like to joke that he was good for business. But so he, he says, I'm going to follow Jesus. Then later on trials and tribulations, we find Peter following Jesus at a distance. And then when Jesus is being led to the cross, it says Peter was following at a distance, but ultimately he denies him three times to the crowd, doesn't he? Now, Peter, that's his last experience with Jesus before Jesus is killed. Now, Uh, Peter doesn't know what else to do. So he and the guys are standing around. Peter goes, let's just go back to fishing. It's interesting because Jesus raises from the dead and his first encounter with Jesus again, well, I'm sorry, with Peter again, is when Peter is going fishing. So Peter goes fishing. They catch nothing. They're out. And and Jesus uh, looks and yells at at the guys, hey, fellas, throw your net. Uh, What are you doing? Uh, We didn't catch anything. Try it again. Throw your net on the other side. And they realize, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. He's alive. Peter jumps in the water, swims to shore, gets to shore. I'm sure at that point realizes, whoops, the last time I had an encounter with you was when I denied you. Jesus gives him the opportunity to reconcile by saying, do you love me three times? He reconciles. And from that point on, when Peter starts to face really difficult situations, Peter no longer runs or hides or cowers. But just like he said in the beginning, I will follow you all the way to death, but he wasn't willing to. After the resurrection, he was willing to, and he did. Now, there's more to just the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. What is it? It's the fact that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so last week, we talked a little bit about that, the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person, is what I said last week. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, because I had a few people look at me funny when I said the Holy Spirit was a person. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. And then I want to discuss a few things. Because as we read scripture last week, Jesus, um, at the Last Supper, before he was crucified, sat with his disciples. And he explained to them what was about to happen. I'm going to go away. It's good that I do go away. 
because I'm going to send someone else to you who is a better helper than I am. And in that discussion, he actually says, it is to your advantage that I go away. And that just, I mean, just when I, it slapped me in the face uh, and woke me up when I read that, those words, it's to your advantage that I go away. Today, I want to talk about that. Why? Why is it to our advantage that Jesus went away and we have the Holy Spirit? Second, if you're not experiencing the advantages of having the Holy Spirit, why not? What is it that causes us to stop receiving or experiencing the advantages of having the Holy Spirit? Third, how do you experience the advantages of the Holy Spirit? If you already are, more so. And if you're not, how do you start? And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's read John 16, 8. We'll jump through this uh, pretty quickly so that we can go have some wonderful uh, continental breakfast together. And then uh, spend some time just in fellowship. John 16, 8. I'm sorry, John 16, starting at verse 5. Verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. This is Jesus talking to the disciples at the Last Supper before he's crucified. I got to go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. I'm telling you guys, I have to leave. I'm going away. Sorrow is filling your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And here's the, 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 the main scripture for today. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Verse 8. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We talked about that last week. He convicts the world of sin That's how he helps us. The Holy Spirit helps us by convicting us of our sin. Because if we don't realize that we're sinful, we don't realize we have need of a Savior. So he convicts us of our sin, so we realize our need for a Savior. Then he convicts us of our righteousness. To be convicted is simply to be convinced. In other words, once we're convicted of our sin and realize we need a Savior, accept Jesus as our Savior, we become convinced of our righteousness. So we're convicted of our righteousness. And then he convicts us of judgment. What does he mean by that? He convinces us, convicts us that judgment has come to the enemy and we have triumphed and have power over the enemy. And he explains it as he goes on here. Nine, of of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world, Satan, the ruler of this world is judged. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you. That blows my mind. Jesus is like, disciples, I got a lot more things to say to you, but I am not going to personally speak them to you. I have a lot more things to say to you, but I cannot, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, someone will tell you everything that I want you to know. It's just not going to be me. It's the helper who's coming. However, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you all things to come. I'm sorry. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. God, thank you again for these verses. Help us, Lord as we have a very short amount of time and I have a lot of things that you gave me to say. So help me to say it all and help us to receive everything, God, that you would want us to know today. Holy Spirit, lead us, teach us, guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Um, I want to ask you a question. How many of you guys would like to have the advantage? Just in general. How many of you would like to have the advantage? All right. I want you to think about sports teams. Okay, I played baseball. When I played baseball, I, th- I thought, and every kid who plays baseball dreams of going to be a professional baseball player. I would have loved to have been a professional baseball player, but I wasn't good enough, right? So I did what everybody does when they get done with baseball uh, in, in school, and they've played as far as they can do. You join a men's recreational softball team and think you're still good enough to play in the major leagues, right? That's what I did. So I played softball. Well, I remember as I first started playing softball, the bat companies were coming out with new technology for bats 
And if you've never heard of it, they have bats that are single wall, double wall, triple wall. Now they have even new technology that I probably don't even know about. But when I was first starting to play, they were coming out with bats that were called triple wall bats. Now, I don't know all the technology behind it, but here's the basics. Something is more springy in the metal. And, and we could tell. So in those first seasons, when they first released those bats, the people who had enough money to go buy those bats would buy it, come out to the softball field, swing half as hard as we did with half the um, technical skills or uh, ability and yet hit home runs all day long because these bats literally were that much springier. That's the only thing I can think of is the a ball hitting a bat and it bounces off the bat that much harder, right? So much so they banned them in the next season. Like once the, the league caught on to it, they're like, no, you can't, you guys can't use these bats. For some of the big guys that could hit hard, it was actually pretty dangerous because they were hitting balls back so fast at pitchers and third basemen and things like that. So so they clearly had the advantage. So my thought about this, when Jesus says, if I go away, it's to your advantage, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, I think about it like this. I'm going to give you the ability to hit home runs through life. How's that sound? Right? And I was like, yes, Lord, I'll take it. Please give me the triple wall bat in life. I would like that. That sounds good, right? Now, it baffles me and blows me away that Jesus sitting in their presence, and I asked you this question last week, how many of you, if Jesus walked in right now and sat right next to you, looked at you and was like, hey, what's up? Okay. How many of you would go, you would freak out, first of all. Second, how many of you would like to, at that point, would, would if he got up, you got up. If he went out the door, you went out the door. If he walked downtown, you went downtown, right? How many of you would just be like, all right, see you, Jesus. Thanks for hanging out with us. Nobody would. I mean, I wouldn't because I want to see what he's going to do next. Like if Jesus is walking around, I'm following him because I'm, I'm ready to watch some limbs grow. I'm ready to watch like all the leaves fall off of trees, right? I'm, and wilt in, the, in an instant. I'm ready to see uh, him go and pray for people to be healed. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, dude. I'm following you everywhere you go, right? Okay. Now, how many of you, if he walked in, sat down next to you, let you follow him around for a day, doing miracles, and then came back to your house that night and said, all right, man, it was nice hanging out with you. Ladies, it was nice hanging out with you. I got to go to the father now. He's expecting me. He's got a seat at his right hand waiting for me. I got to go. But here's the thing. It's to your advantage that I go. Right? I'd be like, eh, I don't know if I believe you, Jesus. Like, I think it's to my advantage that you just stay. Got it. You can have my room. Right? Go ahead and stay. Whatever it takes, I'm going to try to get you to stay. But to the disciples, he says, it's better that I go. Actually, it's not just better. It's to your advantage, which means it was to their disadvantage that he was to stay with them physically. That's mind-blowing. Now, here's the best, most amazing part about that. We are living in the advantage he told them about. But are we experiencing that advantage? For some of us, it doesn't logically compute. Logically, we figure out all the reasons to believe we don't have the advantage that Jesus said we could have. But I'm here to tell you that if you believe Scripture, we should believe that those advantages are available to us. Now, Let me start off by saying who the Holy Spirit is. Because Jesus said, here's the advantage. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. We know what the advantage is. The advantage is we have the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us. Think about this. There was a time that only one person on the earth could talk to God. Think about that. There was a time when only one person on the earth could talk to God. At times there was maybe a couple. But you think about everyone who wanted to talk to God had to go through Moses. There was a time, as far as we can tell, no one talked to God. Hundreds of years. There's no records. We don't know if anyone talked to God. Yet we're living in a time where God actually lives in you. God lives in you. God lives in me. We are the new temple. Okay? Do we understand? I mean, I don't know if we really fully understand that. I don't know if we're able to understand that fully. 
But do we realize that God actually lives in us? The advantages that we have today are mind-blowing. Now, the God that lives in us is the Holy Spirit. And let me give you some scripture to explain who the Holy Spirit is, because we have to understand who he is. Romans 8.26 says this. Romans 8.27. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So that's the first thing I want us to understand today. The Holy Spirit has a mind. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. He will guide us into all truth. That means he knows all truth. He knows every single thing that is true. He's all-knowing. He has a mind. He can think. Second, Acts 16.6. Now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by who? The Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit do? He imposed his will. The Holy Spirit has a will. The, the Holy Spirit has a mind. He forbade them. He forbid them into going into there. So in other words, he had a will. He willed them not. He has a mind. He has a will. And Ephesians 4.25, do not grieve. What is grief? It's an emotion, right? The Holy Spirit has a mind, a will, and emotions. Last week I said the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it or a force. He is a person because he has a personality. He's not a person because he's a human. If you were to look in the Webster's Dictionary, I think the, the, the definition of, of, of person is human. And it, that's not what I mean when I say he's a person. What I, what I mean when I say he's a person is that he has a personality. Just as each of us has a soul, a mind, a will, and emotion, the Holy Spirit has a mind, will, and emotion according to Scripture. So he thinks, he feels, and he has a, des- a will that he will impose. Now, we will only experience his thoughts, his emotions, and his will if we surrender to it and we have a personal relationship with him. He is not a force. He is not an it. He's, he's, we think of him that way because I think of his title. But I want you to think about something for a second. We think his name is the Holy Spirit, but it's not. His name is God. His title is the Holy Spirit. Okay? God the Father... God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the active agent of God on earth today, living in each and every one of you. The Son is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But the Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of us as the active agent of God today. He is God. That is his name. We are at an advantage because he lives in us. Romans 8, 9. I'm moving pretty quick today, so I hope we're all good. You with me? Okay. Romans 8, 9, but when you are not in the flesh, think about this for a second, when you're not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit, indeed, the spirit of God dwells where? In the church building. No. At a mega church. No. In a Catholic temple, in a temple. No. Where does he dwell? In you. In us. When you're in the Spirit, when you're not in the flesh, the Spirit of God lives in us. Okay? And so, as John 16, 13 says, we have a personality living in us, empowering us, who knows everything. Now, how many think that's an advantage? If we can learn to talk to him and use him. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is there for our use. We don't like to think that, but he is. He is. He comes to help us. He is the helper. He's not just there to look at, think about, or know about. He's there to communicate with, engage with, and be led by. And he's there to help us. Remember what we read, John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will do what? He will guide you into all truth. He's way better than Alexa or Google he will, or Siri. He will guide you into all truth. He truly is the know-it-all. Right? A lot of people think they are know-it-alls, but he truly is the, the know-it-all. So, the Holy Spirit 
Scripture, let me say it this way, Scripture will teach you certain things like how to pray. Jesus taught people how to pray, and we can read in the Bible how it says how to pray. Scripture will teach you how to be a husband or a wife or a child and how how to communicate with your parents. Scripture will teach you how to be an employee. Scripture will not teach you who to marry. Scripture will not teach you what job to take. Scripture will not teach you what to invest in, but it will teach you how to in, how to manage your finances. You, you kind of see what I'm saying there? Teacher, scripture will teach you how to pray, but not what to pray. So who tells you what to pray? The Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who will teach us or tell us what to pray. The Holy Spirit is the one. The Bible says we don't know what to pray, actually. But the Holy Spirit tells us. We don't know who to marry, but the Holy Spirit will tell us. And so the better relationship we have with the Holy Spirit, the better advantage we have in life. Okay, now, um, I want you to think about something for a second. The other day, I, I went to the office and I forgot my phone. Anybody ever forgot their phone somewhere and you were without it for half a day or a day within the last year or two years. Just raise your hand. Have you forgot your phone and been without it for half a day or a day in the last year or two years? Have you thought about what it would be like if you did? Okay? Just think about it for a second. Now, I want you to think about your dependency on your phone because I learned a lot that day. I am so dependent on my phone, it felt like I was missing a piece of me for the day. Literally. Literally. Okay, now some of you are judging me right now, and I would say that's because you haven't forgot your phone in the last 6 to 12 months. And so I would challenge you this week, leave your phone at home for one day, and then come back and judge me. Uh, Seriously, think about this. Now, as I thought about this when I was studying for this message, I thought, am I as dependent on the Holy Spirit in everyday life as I am my phone? And I would almost say the answer is no. For me, speaking for myself, that scared me when I had that realization and I thought about that. Now, there may be things I have no idea that I have just come to understand and just I just live every day. The Holy Spirit leads me and guides me, and I don't even realize what he's doing. There's probably a lot of that. But consciously thinking about talking and listening to the Holy Spirit, do I do it as much as I depend about on looking at my phone, my smart device. And I don't know if I do. That scares me. That challenges me. Now, do I realize what I am missing out on? Do I realize the advantages I am not experiencing because I don't... Let me stop there. Do I realize the advantages I'm not experiencing and what is causing me not to experience those advantages? The Bible tells us. So if you can identify with me, with what I experienced in any way, which is I don't understand the advantages because I'm not living in the advantages or it seems like I'm not living in the advantages or I feel like maybe I've had the advantage at times but then it slips away or whatever it might be, I want to just read some scripture to us that may explain it a little bit more. Are you with me? Ephesians 4.20. When you have not, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to what? Deceitful lusts. Remember that term. Deceitful lusts. Verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man or woman which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Remember those two terms. Therefore, putting away lying. Let each of you speak to the truth, the truth with his neighbor, 
For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed from out of your mouth. Think about what's being said here. Deceitful lusts. Put away lying. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Give no place to the devil. Stop stealing. Don't let corrupt words come from your mouth. But what good is for out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Verse 30, don't Grieve the Holy Spirit. 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. Evil speaking. Malice. Just be kind to one another, he says. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So here's the, here was the question. Why don't I experience the advantage or what hinders me from living with the advantage? And here's the answer to that question. Unholiness. This is not a question of our salvation. This is a question of grieving the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin. Now, let me explain it a little bit further. What does it mean to grieve? Think about when a person experiences grieving. We grieve when we lose relationship with someone or can't have relationship with someone. A friend leaves. A a person who's close to us passes away. We grieve, right? We we experience grief. We grieve. All this right here said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't cut off intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Because when we sin, we distance ourselves from him as almost, almost as though we were dying to him in a, in a way. And the Holy Spirit says, I grieve because I, re- I desire the relationship with you. But because you have given in to deceitful lusts, we don't have that intimacy anymore. And you lose the advantage. You don't lose your salvation necessarily but we lose the advantage. Now, I don't know about you, but I was rocked this week, challenged with, David, just shut up and stop for a second and listen to the Holy Spirit. Just listen. I don't know what to say to you, Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter. I'm just going to listen. And when he tells me to go cut the grass, I'm going to go cut the grass. And when he tells me, here's the answer to that problem you had at work, I'm going to say, thank you. And when he opens my eyes to that scripture I didn't understand, I'm going to say, Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. Because those are the kinds of things that happen when we tune our ear into the Holy Spirit, give up on the things that deceive us. Deceitful lusts. I want you to think about that for a second. Adam and Eve, what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden? They were what? They were deceived by the devil because they lusted after what the devil offered them. Now, I want you to think through what he says. Don't give in to deceitful lusts. Put away lying. How many of you believe oftentimes it's better if I lie, I'll, I'll, I'll feel better, and the outcome will be better if I just lie? Otherwise, why would, we have to believe that. Why else would we lie? There's no reason to lie unless you believe that's the, that it's going to be better to. What happened? We were deceived based on our lusts. So we lied. Or let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth. It me. I was led to believe, I was deceived into thinking that these corrupt words coming out of my mouth would actually bring me more satisfaction and happiness and the, and the advantage, more so, than living holy. But every time we do that, we distance ourselves a little further from the Holy Spirit, losing the advantage. So here's the thing. If we feel as though we don't understand or live... Now, here, hear me out. There are advantages we are living in we have no idea that we're living in. 
It's just we've been Christians and had the Holy Spirit living in us, and we've become familiar with it and used to it. And we don't even realize we're, we're experiencing it. And you do. We all experience it. But then there is a close intimacy where we actually have conversations. We feel his presence. He talks to us in circumstances. We just live with him. Like I live with Leida. I can talk to him. I can listen to him. I can experience him. I feel his emotions. He feels mine. I know his will and his choices compared to my will and my choices. And there's intimacy and there's experience there. And when we realize that, live in that, we then live with the advantage Jesus talked about. So if you find yourself without the advantage, what do you do? If you find out that you're no longer experiencing the advantages that that you want to experience, what do you do? We'll just go back through Ephesians 4.20. Because that's where it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit, which is distancing ourselves and losing intimacy. If you want to regain intimacy with the Holy Spirit, which means you can talk to God and you can have that engagement with God. Remember, the Bible says you don't know what to pray unless the Holy Spirit leads you. How do you talk to God? You pray. Praying is talking to God. So if we don't have the Holy Spirit to tell us and lead us into what to say, if that doesn't start just make quickening scriptures to you, when the Bible says, pray anything in his will and it will be given to you, how often are we praying things out of his will? If we pray anything in his will, it was led by the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the one who knows what to pray. We have to remain connected to the Holy Spirit as we talk to God. But we have the ability to talk to God. That's the good thing. Now, if you find yourself at a disadvantage, how do you regain the advantage? It's pretty simple, but hard. Simple answer, hard to do. And here it is, back in Ephesians 4.20, um, 4.24. Put on the new man, which is created according to God, in true righteousness. That's Jesus. Put on Jesus. Ask forgiveness for your sins. Repent. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Believe in him as the sacrifice made for your life. And that he took your sin and you became righteous. Righteousness and holiness. Living a holy lifestyle living without the things that are discussed here. And he even gives us an explanation of what some of those things are. Put away lying. But he, he, he says what to get rid of. If you, if you, these are the things that will give you a disadvantage. Here's what will give you an advantage. Speak truth. Speak the truth. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Work things out with people before it gets nighttime and you go to sleep. Stop stealing. Steal no longer. But then he adds to that. Instead, work with your hands, which is good. Why? So that you have something to give those who are in need. Help others who are in need. Don't let bad words come out of your mouth, but what? Speak things that are edifying. Build people up. Speak things that build people up. Be kind. Be tender-hearted. And forgive one another. Jeremy, would you come up, man? We're going to wrap it up. The Bible says what? God said to us, be holy as I am holy. He calls us his holy nation. Removing sin from our life and furthermore participating in righteous deeds brings us into closer intimacy with the Holy Spirit and gives us the advantage. I'm not talking about your salvation. I realize that we don't earn salvation. I am talking about intimacy with Christ and experiencing the advantage that he said was available to all of us if he were to go be seated at the right hand of the Father because he made a way for us to have a relationship with the Father, be righteous in his eyes, and gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always there saying, hey, you want to have a talk? Hey, need a hug? Hey, need some help? Hey, are you listening? And meanwhile, we're walking the wrong direction, enamored with deceitful lusts. 
And what I'm trying to say to you today is turn your back on the deceitful lusts because Jesus sent the helper who convicts us of our righteousness, our sin, convinces us of our righteousness, and convinces us of of our power over the devil who is the deceiver. Turn your back on the deceiver, the deceitful lusts. Put your eyes on Jesus. Recognize the Holy Spirit. God himself is living in you. He has thoughts, emotions, and a will. Communicate with him and live in the advantage of walking with God. That does not mean that you're going to, you know, some of us connect the advantage to Publishers Clearinghouse is going to show up at my doorstep tomorrow. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about your humanity. I'm talking about joy that surpasses understanding, peace that surpasses understanding. I'm talking about living righteous. I'm talking about understanding um, who you are in Christ I'm talking because some of the greatest Christians who are most connected to the Holy Spirit suffered unto death for Jesus, right? But all the look at Stephen. Stephen was was persecuted by by Saul uh, and stoned to death. But even till the end, I believe, even till the end, he was looking at God, just thankful to God for the relationship he had with them, saying, "I love you, God." He had peace uh, with everything going on that we can experience things and have the advantage in ways that we don't even understand when we, li- when we recognize our righteousness and live a holy lifestyle. My challenge for us today is to live holy because the Holy Spirit is the one who we should be taking orders from, listening to, asking help from. He lives in us. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. God, thank you for our time together this morning. God, forgive us of every deceitful lust we have participated in. Wash us and cleanse us, Jesus, of our sins. We trust in you. Jesus, we take you as our Lord and our Savior. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. Because of you, I am righteous. We stand today confessing that, and we ask, would you cleanse us and make us right with you? And then I thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit. Today, God, we repent of the sins that have distanced us from the intimacy with the Holy Spirit that we should have. Holy Spirit, we're sorry that we have grieved you. And we pray that you would just draw near to us, and and we choose to draw near to you right now. Help us to understand your mind, will, and emotions and to surrender ours to yours. That we would live a holy lifestyle with the advantage each and every day of our life. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice. Thank you for going to the Father and sending us the helper. And thank you, Holy Spirit.